Hello, everyone, and welcome to the What Culture Horror Podcast. I'm Josh, joined today by Ben Roy. Who? Boo, because we both have a love of post-apocalyptic horror films. And I recently um, recommended Ben Roy to watch one that I think might have scarred him a little bit for life. So we're going to talk about that today and talk about why we love the genre, what makes this specific example work. But there's no point beating around the bush anymore. The movie in question is Threads, which is a 1984 post-apocalyptic drama that actually aired as a TV movie on the BBC and was really difficult to get um, your hands on for a long time. Like, growing up in the UK, I think the sort of cult surrounding this movie, the mythology surrounding this film was, you know, absolutely astronomical because at least when I was growing up, I couldn't actually get my hands on it. People had seen it because it had aired on the TV, but it was really hard to get the DVD or get the Blu-ray or whatever. But now it's much more easily available and we've both seen it. I watched it um, last year and it scarred me for life. So I just kind of want to jump straight into it, Ben Roy. What were your initial reactions just before we jump into the actual plot specifics or whatever? Uh, not to blaspheme too much, but Jesus Christ, when I started watching it, and <laughs> I, it was, um, I fell into a trap during this period of lockdown where I've watched a few films that you just shouldn't watch on your own in lockdown, like uh, just the tangents, Requiem Re- Re- for a Dream, don't watch that alone in um, lockdown, but this one was another one where I didn't know what to expect because I'm still, I don't know about you Josh, but I still like to judge things on their box art, like even though there's not really, mm-hmm. I don't really have physical boxes for films anymore because half the stuff I rent on Amazon or whatever but um yeah just going to this i i expected it to be about clothes because i don't like to read things either i i I don't like to when i get a recommendation i don't like to look at the trailer i don't like to look at many of the synopsis i just have to go in and see what's going to happen and i knew that you recommended it to me because i went to chernobyl was it last year and you was like oh you you like you like radiation how about this and i was like okay then let's see what's going on here (laughs) and it's, it feels otherworldly it feels like an alternate mm-hmm. universe watching this film it's so weird like um totally man neither of you and me are, w- w- existed in the 80s uh, <laughs> anyone no, who did listen to this lol but um we have seen so much media from the 80s and we've like mm-hmm. it seems to have infested like our lives in somewhere and i've already been music film tv whatever and it just feels like that they've taken this part of the 80s, which you don't really see Sheffield in anything ever, do you? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So for people who, I guess, don't don't know about the general plot, it's about this, well, it's about Sheffield. It's about the, a few unassuming characters in it. In the, for the yeah. first half of the movie, it's like period settings that's set in the 80s. You just follow these people going about their day-to-day lives, you know, dealing with their, you know, very real human problems, relationship troubles. They're trying to get laid, stuff like that. But then a nuclear warhead goes off and everything goes to hell. So this is obviously, you know, um, you know, made during the height of the the big nuclear scare. And it was essentially done as a kind of way to inform people about the very real realities of what could happen if everything did go wrong. And we did, you know, fall into a big nuclear war. And this just gives us that depiction in a completely unflinching way that I don't know if you would agree, Ben Roy, but it, it overcomes all of its limitations, you know, considering this was made decades ago, considering it already yeah. had a budget of about £400,000, considering that it aired on TV on the BBC, like the sense of scale and sense of dread is pure purely palpable like it just it overcomes all those limitations to give you something that is visually striking and yet works on that kind of like deep horror level that completely conveys the scale of the disaster it's weird because like i totally agree and i'm watching this it feels like something that would have been shown in a classroom as well like i remember like all those sort of things you'd watch about like make sure you um don't uh throw a wet towel over a stove and things like that and don't smoke because <laughs> it's bad for you and then there's a scary man with the drugs around the corner and don't go into someone's stranger's van with some sweeties it's got all those sort of like sort of the feeling of those like info videos that you had had like every yeah. now and then like you'll be, you get a week at school where it's like like um you know you the sector the week and have all these other weeks like fire protection week and the roller tv and you thought this would be something you watch there but it's weirdly i think that's part of why it's so chilling because it feels like mm-hmm. it's just showing you something that has possibly happened or like could could have very well happened back at the height of the cold like the cold war when the the nuclear scale was still a very real thing i don't um i it's just and how people don't really and wouldn't have really taken it sort of like seriously. Like 
yeah knowing like say uh older relatives i don't know they i think we all could think of a few relatives that'd be like oh is that a nuclear bar just run under a cold tap and it'll be fine sort of thing <laughs> run it under a cold tap and that radiation will go away sort of thing and that's what yeah and that's how a lot of people in this film like uh, as well as treat this sort of thing to begin with like our uh, because um i i Maybe it's just because, I don't know, me and you have consumed a lot of content like over the years, or it be games, films, books, whatever, where radiation is a very real threat. And like, especially coming off Chernobyl, was it not last year, the year before now, where like they've sort of reinserted that sort of like the invisible threat as something that you should be mm-hmm. worried about. Like you hear the clicks of a go counter, you know, so, you know something's wrong. And then you see people taking uh precautions what like governments would have said at the time is put a few doors over and then they put a mattress over that door you'd be fine there's no way you're yeah. gonna die there sort of thing well you've touched on a, on a few different points there but i want to go back to like the british thing in particular i suppose because i think that's where a lot of the horror kind of lies because for the first what 20 minutes half an hour or something it almost plays like a soap opera like it's not qu- you described it to me as like almost a documentary you know what i mean it's not yeah. framed like a mockumentary or anything like that but the human drama is so kind of like daft and silly and the characters just kind of feel so real that it completely jars with the proper horrific depictions of, you know, the consequences and the outcomes of, you know, the radiation, the explosion and stuff like that, that it just sort of hits you with this kind of like whiplash of tone and kind of presentation where you're like, I thought I knew what I was getting myself in for. I thought this was going to be an exaggerated, silly infomercial or whatever, but it does tap into the same kind of, feelings of unassuming horror like you said like the invisible threat or whatever that those kind of daft uh, kind of warning videos um did like for sure and i think that um i think it just ultimately creates this sense of unease right from the get-go because you do have this very british approach to it you know what i mean almost sean the dead-esque like you said you know philip's being bit by a zombie he's got to run it over under a hot tap like it's the exact same <laughs> thing here it's the exact same mentality but that sort of makes the horror even more haunting because then you see these characters you know from all walks of life you've got like the working class leads you've got the older people who just clearly don't grasp the gravity of the situation who are hiding under like their doors and stuff and you know that they're going to be be gone as you know this can't have a happy ending but even when i was watching it i thought like it must get better there's no way this tv movie from the 80s will will not wrap up with at least some sense of hope but every single time I thought it got to the, to the as worse as it can be, it just keeps on digging. And I think that's what makes it so special. Just when you think you've seen every horrific moment, it'll pull something else out of the bag and explain how the world can get worse, how these people's lives can get worse, how there's no coming back from this event should it happen. And I think the way it sort of just treats it so matter of factly, like you get those title screens that pop up every so often where it informs you how many people have died, what's happened around the world, you know, how governments are reacting and stuff. And it's so coldly and bluntly um, conveyed that I, I was watching it on a hangover, man. I watched it after Chernobyl because I thought, oh, right, I'm in the mood. I tracked it down. I bought a ridiculously expensive Blu-ray just to watch it. And it was, it was the most harrowing, like hour and a half, two hours of my life, because not only was I feeling sick from the copious amounts of alcohol I drank the night before, I was also feeling sick just about everything that I was seeing on screen. It put me in a zone that sort of few films get me in, I guess. Having watched this after people bought too much toilet roll because of certain things in the world and then seeing it happen in this film was also yeah. like so weirdly reflective. Like you could just see this happening. Like <laughs> from the point when there's a threat of nuclear war and some old lady is arguing over 40 pence over something that's yeah. gone up in price. Like just the weird little thing that how society never gets truly prepared for it and like and especially being set in the 80s like you have certain town halls being set up and people are in a basement and all fags are hanging out like cigarettes everywhere like ash and, like, and just look at this like this is it wasn't so long ago still like this sort of time period and you, you can just see with a few tweaks you could see this sort of exact same scenario happening today which is oddly like terrifying and how like um you hear like what the government suggested about about them like oh if you're outside get on the floor just just yeah just lie down and be fine just lie down and get ready to be eviscerated yeah (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. it's like oh that's like one of the scariest parts i think is just watching all of these 
tin pot kind of structures that were put into place in the hopes of helping after everything went to hell just continue to crumble and like fall apart and the human error that kind of like goes along with that like you said you know you've got all of these precautions or things that you're supposed to do in the event that this happens but essentially they're just sort of there to try and keep the peace and not result in everyone sort of trampling over each other or kind of like putting themselves above the other person and that results in these like horrific situations where you're just watching these people and you know everything they're doing is just completely futile and you know they're just absolutely doomed and yet you, you hope you still hope deep down because obviously it's such a good reflection of reality that you you want them to pull through you want these structures these stupid yeah. town hall meetings to come up with something some kind of plan and again spoilers but they don't and then everyone more or less just dies horrifically in the process and it amounts to nothing Half of this film is like at least the nuke, the warhead doesn't go off until about 50 minutes into the film, and like mm-hmm. half of it is pre- preparing for it. You'll think, Oh, it's not gonna happen, it's no way it's gonna get to that point if you've not if not, you've not exposed yourself to any of like say images of this film at all. And then it happens, and then it's like, Oh, you think I'd be over quickly? No, they they show a lot of things getting blown up, and it's weird for that time as well. It seems like very sort of like not indulgent, but like trying to getting there like this is this would happen and like some of the just yeah. flashes of people everyone you've seen up to this point getting blown away like the couple a couple just moving into a flat and redecorating it or there's one household where the ones that hide under a door where for the i swear 20 minutes is the husband trying to get the door off the hinges and his wife is like oh, don't do that you're just chip, gonna chip the paint <laughs> and then <laughs> lo and behold their house is always flattened like say 10 minutes later sort of thing uh, it's totally. just it's, it's, I think another point of this being so weird is the time period to be set. You, you just don't expect this to sort of like come out of then, like either come out of then or be yeah. set then, even though obviously yeah. we, we, we weren't alive and we weren't really there for the nuclear scale. Like when I was born, the Cold War was around for another year sort of thing. And after that, it was like sort of gone. And again, like you just... And you see, you think, ah, oh, yeah, well, it's fine. They could do week one sort of thing. Uh, they, they talk about what happens and how much food resources are there. And you think, ah, oh, the government's still got some food. The government's still got some sort of fuel. They'll get from there. And then they start going into sort of like from what would happen with a nuke and how you should sort of like treat, how, what you should do to prepare for this and how most families didn't. And then what theoretically would happen next and then we spiral as you said down and down to this plug hole of despair and descent like <laughs> oh no and we see uh, eventually the text that we've seen on screen which is telling us sort of like what's happening or what could happen is accompanied by a voiceover i think it is after a while mm-hmm. uh just to go in depth and just to ham home what's happening and you think, ah, oh, it's going to be fine, Josh. And then you think we get to week one you think, oh, well, <laughs> you know, they'll be all right after week one surely, right? Yeah, yeah, surely. That's, that's, that's as long as radiation lasts, it goes, it goes away after that, I've heard. Yeah, and then <laughs> you start, we quickly accelerate and say, like, oh, well, Pete, there is money. It's pointless. What's the point of money? Because yeah. now, guess what? The, um, you're not going to see the sun for years, by the way, because the dust clouds, the, the radioactive dust clouds in the sky have blotted out the sun. Have you seen 300 where your arrows are blotted? So no, this radiate, radioactive dust is going to do it. And, and quickly from, oh, people are just going to go into camps because we need them to work. And th- this might be yeah. the last ever sort of harvest we have with fuel. And just, mm-hmm. it's, it just, you can't, because obviously they show a sort of radius of like where you expect people to be obliterated straight away. And then they go, well, the people on this ring here, as we've seen in other fiction, uh, is this these are probably be the worst ones off because they're gonna be the ones that slowly die and choke to death and on their own guts and their throats yeah. as they all sort of melt and then there's the ones even further out which then proceed to live for years and years and maybe um i don't know to spoil it yet a decade later where they're out in the fields and it's cold because summer is now winter and guess what winter is now even more winter <laughs> yeah, it's double winter. It's winter two, the second coming of winter, I guess. Do you no, like being right. cold? Like, I think what it, I don't, I hate it. I, hate, I can't, can't hack this now, Ben Roy, never mind a nuclear winter. Um, yeah, I mean, what I really love about it is the way that they sort of blend that kind of, the big scale, the big picture with the sort of, because you follow some characters throughout and, you know, a lot of them die, but some of them kind of continue and 
try to evolve with the times, but obviously don't get very far. And I just think it, it, it spends that first 50 minutes or whatever getting you invested in this town, in this really unassuming place where you don't expect anything on this horrific level to happen. You don't expect to see a, you know, a zombie movie set in Sheffield, just like you wouldn't expect a zombie movie to be set in Newcastle or anything like that. Yeah. It's sort of this town that's rarely in movies, rarely glamorized in that way. So to get you invested in that place, get you invested in these characters, to then blow it out while you're still following them, it just it makes you it delivers a sense of doom. I think that is you just can't escape from because there's there's it accounts for almost every possibility, every alternate scenario scenario you might like concoct in your head as to to explain why it might be all right eventually this film just comes out and says no it won't it's going to be horrible it's going to get worse you're going to be miserable and i think it nails it all the way through in a way that you know we've watched a bunch of post-apocalyptic movies that's why we were so interested in this to begin with and my worry when i was going into it after so much hype and so much anticipation and so much like i said at the beginning mythology surrounding it about this is this is one of the scariest movies ever made. This is going to haunt you. This is going to scar you for life. Like, I, I wondered whether, you know, having watched a bunch of movies where an, an apocalypse has happened, a nuclear bomb has dropped, whether it would lose some of its edge. But I really don't think it does. It's interesting comparing it to things with bigger budgets or things with kind of uh, more resources at their disposal that I, I still love, but don't quite nail that sort of sense of just complete and utter despair in the same way yeah. this does. Yeah, I don't know if you would agree, or if you'd have any comparisons. It's weird because like the, the, there's, I think there's some uh, miniature work in this, which they blur the miniatures, and whenever they show the nuclear sort of bomb, they they cut to like say stock footage of a mushroom cloud, and then they have they just flash lights to people, and you know, or well, they're gone, sort of thing. And that yeah. works perfectly enough as it is. You don't need any more than that. And it's like, um, as I just sort of like look at this film as I'm talking to you, like when they take someone's house and then they utterly ruin it. it to me, it, it has such a feeling of like saying, um, beware of smoking when you're in your home back in, because back in the eighties, every bit of furniture was flammable. If you sneeze, mm-hmm. you had a chance to set your house on fire. And it just looks like one of those info films when someone's burnt their house down. And then the, the, the harrowing pit of like, say the husband having to look for water for his wife and then he turns the tap on, it's like, oh, and and then he goes back to get a colander, which obviously has holes in it because he's so disorientated yeah. from the blast. The water stops. And from like another fan who's like, uh, what they heard on the radio or the, was it the voiceover saying, uh, if you're, if a family member dies, just put, take them out of the room you're in and leave them out there. Like some of you like, yeah. oh, well, you can't do anything for them. Just stick them outside sort of thing. Yeah. I, and then like, it just, I, I don't know. It just, it doesn't need the big budget when it's so such a grim tone and it's shot so just realistically. I mean, there's no shaky cam. This is all sort of like on mounted cameras on tripods. You can, you can imagine today if it was done, someone would be holding the camera and moving it about a bit more and maybe yeah. you'd get a bit more, sort of like you'd hear a bit more like, uh, of a Geiger counter going off. But um, just, I think how, cause it's so raw and if some parts of it, you like, you just the, the shot of the wife holding her dead baby in like in a street as someone else is walking along who um is searching for her uh other half who you've seen be obliterated and by the way she's pregnant mm-hmm. and she's walking around in a in Sheffield which is just being hit by a nuke so you know like things are gonna go bad there and there's always this there's more and more grim blocks building up upon each other and you just it if I think it just pulls you through because you're sort of like sitting there sort of thinking about all these characters and knowing they're already yeah. all dead and how certain people are like, oh, well, the town hall's still alive. They, they'd be fine, but they're stuck <laughs> in. They'll eventually get out. Spoilers. They, 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 they will die down there of starvation or radiation poison yeah. and they, people will finally get to them and they're all dead. And yeah. it's just- I think that's... Like that that's that's part of well like yeah, that is part of what makes us a horrible because even in like the the worst, most depressing, post apocalyptic, you know, kind of like Hollywood movies, you know, like the road or whatever, like that, there's always still an element of sensationalization when it comes to like the characters and the narrative. There might not be much, but you always know that you're following a hero or you're following someone's story, and that story is a going to amount to something ultimately, no matter how depressing it might be. It's slightly gonna be more larger than life but here like for most of the characters in fact their stories amount to nothing and you will spend so much time with someone to just cut back 
and then it's like they're gone, they're dead, they've, they've died off screen. This thing is just sort of, it's taken someone else. We're going to move the focus to this other character and then see how they fare. And inevitably, they don't fare very well. And it is that kind of the coldness to the material that um, really gets under your skin because like it, it treats no one. Like no one's got any kind of like plot armor or anything like, like that. It is, like you said, it's almost like a teacher in school just going through kind of like the facts and being like this is going to happen this is going to happen this is going to happen and then giving you like a stern telling off and a stern warning about what's kind of going to go on and i think even though we have seen stuff like chernobyl now which deals with the effects of you know radiation poisoning and stuff like that in like the most visceral kind of like wherever like you see episodes where you're up close and personal with these absolutely kind of um, you know, ridiculously expensive makeup effects that people have spent hours and hours perfecting that look incredibly gory. And yes, that is incredibly effective, but it's so, at least for me it was, it was so interesting to immediately const- contrast that big budget production, which I think did all that stuff very well with this thing that kind of does just so much with so little and kind of see where they both um, shared similarities, again, in the coldness and the presentation of you know, this is going to happen. You cannot change it. You have to live with this inevitability, but also see how they contrasted and how they kind of either lingered on like the destruction or lingered on like the deaths of the characters or just kind of like skipped ahead and were kind of not presenting any sort of character narrative. I think that's the real unique thing about threads when compared to other things in the genre. Yeah, and there's never, what I've noticed, there's never really a blame game either. I think someone might have said one thing about the Russians in like the town hall. Apart from that, it's just people just getting through the event. Like, and it's almost like uh, the the great tool of any sort of storyteller is like talk about it and then say, show the effects of it on it or on a person, but you don't show what's actually happening. Like, say, just cut into some text as you hear some typewriter uh, go. Uh, 17 to 38 million people die from the blast and then even more from the fallout of the dust just so you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. Like, oh. and we we don't really follow any characters to be fair and there's no sort of hero sort of no oh, pardon me there's no sort of like hero's journey that we do sort of like have one character we follow for the most throughout the years but even like towards the end though that character doesn't really meet a decent end but we see events following that like when we get to like even when we have like say the stereotypical like uh humans being the bad people in this like uh we don't it's never really clear if they went down and bad this like old couple in the basement or anything like that and then they eventually get killed over a packet of prawn cocktail crisps like it's just like yeah. it's it's it, it bringing things into perspective sometimes and just looking at like, what could be like how quickly anything you have now any how quickly like my daily reliance on any non-branded energy drink could be just gone because <laughs> by the way supply lines are done within a week and then all the all the sort of like stockpiles just get uh, used and just gone away because we don't stockpile enough and guess there's just nothing not enough to go around and just it's so sort of drab and dreary and like even towards the end and you think, oh, and then it's just like, oh no. So like, I, if you're going to, if anyone listens to this or watching this, watches threads, like give yourself like an hour afterwards to watch something fun on YouTube or something like that afterwards. <laughs> well, it's funny, man. Cause I think I've laughed more in this episode than I have in most ones. And it's not because yeah. the subject matter is funny. It's not because the, the, the movie's funny or anything like that. It's just because I've sort of got it. I've got to, otherwise if I think about it too much, if I get too into it, it is, it's too scary. It's too haunting because I can rem- remember the feeling of watching it for that first time and just feeling like on edge for days after, even though we're not living through that same context, even though we, we aren't its target audience for who it was made, made for, which I guess were kind of like our parents and stuff. Like yeah. it's, it's still, I, I keep saying it, it's still just so effective and so unique. And definitely for me, like just, just lives up to the hype, lives up to its legacy and delivers this, twist on such a popular genre especially over the past 10 years or so that that no one's really ripped off in the same way people have tried to rip it off but they've never quite matched it and i do think it's kind of this flash in the pan sort of lightning strikes once experience that i don't know if you'll be able to replicate like at all under the exact same circumstances 
The the interesting thing I will say is the director uh, Mick Jackson went on to do Volcano. <laughs> so like interesting. There is some like there is some sort of imagery there of like Volcano is sort of like the. Is it, would you say that's the more serious version of Dante's Peak? I can't remember which one was the more serious volcano disaster movie. Oh, back God, in I can't that remember. Day. But there's a lot of like horrible stuff in Volcano as well. And like, yeah, with, with Fred, it's just like, it does, it's just, it does so much with so little. And it's one of these, one of these films that was probably made to just be like a one-off educational thing on TV. Like, yeah. Like back when the BBC was still hardly like uh, backing anything up, like for years they didn't back up things on Doc Two, for example. And then it just right, it's just like oh yeah, nuclear holocaust is not going to be good. And then when we shoot, as I said before, when we shoot forward and let's say, is it ten years is the first it goes? Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it, it might as well go. Oh, by the way, it's still. It's, I mean, I've just sworn there, so I'll we'll have to bleep that. But by the way, yeah, still bad. And you're just like, God. <laughs> God, everything is miserable and it's only going to get worse. I'm not sure whether we're going to convince anybody to watch this because we're just talking about how like bad it is and how terrible we felt and how awful it is, and how hard it is to find. But I definitely yeah. would recommend it if you have like any interest in sort of, well, this genre as a whole for one, but also kind of like the whole mythology of, you know, not not banned movies. The movie was never banned, but it was certainly, it was hard to get. It had a reputation, you know what I mean? It would show up now and again on, um, you know, uh, TV channels. It would be broadcast and it would be gone, that it would be on DVD, that it would be out of print. And now, I think for the most part, you can get it relatively easy or at least easier than ever. And I think even if you're not British, even if you're kind of not from that generation or whatever, it has a lot of value as like, not only like a movie, but almost like a piece of cinematic yeah. history or whatever. That would be my sort I of think, final send up, my final sell to everyone. And my final thing is, I think like if you, if I think if Chernobyl grabbed you like so many, it did so many people. I think it's also that's probably the best comparison for this sort of thing. Yeah, definitely, one hundred percent. It makes an absolutely horrific back to back experience. If you just want to ruin a weekend, if you just want to say, "Nah, I want to feel terrible for three days," just watch Chernobyl, watch Threads then watch Threads again and then come back here and just wallow in the horribleness with me and Ben Roy. So yeah, I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Do you have any interest in checking this movie out? Or have you all already seen it? I would really like to know if it if you enjoyed it as much as we did, if it resonated with you as much as it did for us. Let us know in the comments if you're watching the video version or if you're listening to the audio version. Come check us out on Twitter at WCultureHorror. I think is the exact handle. What culture are you? You'll be able to find it if you search it. Leave us a comment on there or you can message us directly um, on Twitter. I'm at the handle Josh Brune with two O's. You can message Ben Roy on Twitter at, at Ben Roy Turner. And until next time, we will see you soon. Try not to be too upset by watching threads, I say. Get some Simpsons up. And if you if you're gonna go down this route, man, get some Simpsons up. Videos of cats on YouTube, something nice, yeah. or more what culture horror videos, you know? That's my final yeah. plug of the day. I'm definitely gonna end this now. Right. Bye, Ben Roy. Goodbye. <laughs>